Welcome to another episode of Mike's Money Picks. Today on the podcast, we're going to be discussing this week's PGA Tour alternate event, the Barracuda Championship, which is taking place near Lake Tahoe in California on the entire opposite side of the Atlantic Ocean uh, from where most people are putting their attention to this week with the Open Championship. But hey, it's a PGA Tour event. There's opportunities for money to be made by playing DFS and by betting. Uh, and it's a little bit of a unique format that makes for interesting watch. It's going to be a great weekend of golf with having the Open Championship on during the mornings and then being able to watch the Barracuda Championship at night. So on this episode, we're going to give you a full preview of the Barracuda Championship. We are going to talk about the unique golf course for this event, the unique format for this event, and then we're going to profile a lot of the golfers that are playing in this event and tell you who we are targeting for our DraftKings lineups and for our betting cards this week. If you like what you see, please like the video if you're watching on YouTube and please rate and review the podcast if you're listening to it on audio. I cannot stress enough. It really helps me out. I used to think that people were just like pandering when they used to ask for likes, but like now that I'm actually creating content, I do realize it actually makes a huge difference. So please help me out with that. And if you subscribe to the podcast or to the YouTube channel, you'll be notified new episodes drop like next week's episode that's going to preview the 3M Open. We're also going to be talking live golf for next event, as well as our upcoming college football and NFL season long content. All right, enough with the introduction. Let's go ahead and start talking about Tahoe Mountain Club. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about the old Greenwood course at the Tahoe Mountain Club, which has been the host of the Barracuda Championship for the last four editions of this tournament. Side note, I really think the marketing department's missing a huge opportunity if they don't make the song Barracuda by heart the official theme song of you know this tournament. I'm not going to try to use it here on this podcast because I don't want to get copyrighted, but um, you know, great song, great little melody that they could totally use in and out of commercials that would make for um, a little bit of excitement. Anyway, that's beside the point. The old Greenwood course plays as a par 72 to members, um, but it's going to play as a par 71 this week. It does rate out at about 7,500 yards. Um, it is generally ranked as a very highly touted public golf course. Um, it was designed by Jack Nicholas, um, who notably on the PGA Tour also designed Muirfield Village and PGA National. Um, when you look at the scorecard, what you have this week is you have a lot of long par fours. That is kind of the... Um, you know, the bread and butter of this course is you've got a lot of long par fours. However, when you give everything a little bit of a closer look, this course is up in the mountains. It's up near Lake Tahoe. Um, we're looking at a little over a mile high elevation. And so this course, while on the card, it's going to be about 7,500 yards. It's actually going to play much shorter than that. So for these golfers, the ability to kind of adapt their yardages and their clubs to kind of hit the right distances while adjusting for elevation is definitely going to be an advantage this week. In terms of the grass surface, the greens are a bent POA mix. So I don't really want to put too much stock into that because there is differences in putting on bent and putting on POA. And since it's a mix, I don't really want to get too in the weeds with that. But anyway, this is not that dissimilar of a design um, from Jack Nicholas's other course, Muirfield Village, that gets played on the PGA Tour, where you've got generally pretty wide fairways into decently tough green complexes. I think these green complexes are uh, a good deal easier than the ones that you're going to see at Muirfield Village. But when you look at all the flyovers, you look at this course, like it's not going to be very hard to hit fairways, and you're going to have to give yourself opportunities for birdie um, if you want to give yourself a chance to win this tournament. So when you're looking at this course, when you're looking at its character, Characteristics with it not being super wide, with it having a lot of long par fours. My two best comp courses are the one I already discussed, Muirfield Village, also designed by Jack Nicholas. The second comp course that I like for this one is TPC Craig Ranch, home of the Byron Nelson, another longer than average course with wider than average fairways and decently big greens. Um, I, I think much like that tournament, this is going to turn into a bit of a birdie fest. Now, also another course that I think you can use, the last one that I'm going to mention, uh, Mayakoba uh, for the Worldwide Technologies Championship, El Camelion Golf Course. Um, I think you can use that one as a little bit of a comparison because that one does have um, the elevation difference. It, it's played at a very high elevation. So um, I do think you can use those as your comp courses this week. Now, one thing that I do want to talk about also is, is the difference in format in this event. So this is not a stroke play event on the PGA Tour. They used a modified Stableford scoring system, which is different, but it's a fun change of pace for an event that's going on at the same time as a major that nobody really, really pays a whole lot of attention to. So um, it's one that kind of goes a little bit under the radar, but I kind of like the format. Uh, what it does is it very much stresses 
birdie making and even eagle making because when you look at the scoring with it being five for an eagle two for a birdie and zero for par and then minus one for a bogey birdie bogey is a plus one for points par par is zero for points. Now, for us playing on DraftKings this week, um, that is not going to affect us a whole lot because DraftKings is still doing their scoring the way they always do. But the placement points and the placement of the leaderboard is going to be determined by the Stableford system as opposed to regular stroke play. Also, it is worth noting with the Stableford scoring system, live betting is generally taken off the board for this event, like while the round is going on. You can probably get numbers in between days, but like live betting while the round is going on because the books don't really know how to adjust with that scoring system um, is something that is not usually offered. Now, when you look at the winners here, you can kind of equate the winning score. Eric Van Ruyen set the record with 50 points. I believe it was minus 21 by strokes when he won um, that year. So uh, this is going to be a bit of a birdie fest, and it is going to reward guys who have the ability to make those birdies. Now, I want to go ahead and take a look at the custom model on rickrungood.com. I did not get too funky with this one. Um, what I wanted to look at was because you have golfers on different tours playing in this event, I wanted to look at weighted strokes gain total for the last 40 rounds, which the top five in that category are Ches Reeby, Bo Hostler, Patrick Rogers, Mark Hubbard, and Steven Yeager. I also wanted to give course history a boost, so strokes gain Tahoe Mountain Club. The top five in terms of course history here are Eric Van Ruyen, Martin Laird, Ches Reeby, Austin Smotherman, and Taylor Pendrith. And then the next ones are all having to do with kind of the composition of the event and um, the golf course and the format of the event for that matter. I wanted to look at birdie or better gained. Now, number one in that category is Matt Ryan, who um, is not the former Atlanta Falcons quarterback. He's a $6,100 golfer who doesn't really have a whole lot of rounds to bank on. So I'm not really taking too much into that account. The next five that show up on this list are Nicholas Moeller, Peter Quest, Vincent Norman, Aaron Cockrell, and Mark Hubbard. Opportunities gained, which is how many birdie putts within 15 feet you give yourself, somehow ended up being a lot of the Euros at the top of this list. Martin Simonson, Marcus Kinolt, Eduardo Molinari, Louis Diager, and Tapio pull cannon. And then I also looked at strokes gained long courses because, you know, even with the elevation, this is going to be a longer golf course than usual. And the best guys at long courses, Sam Stevens, Steven Yeager, Jason Scrivener, Charlie Hoffman, and Patrick Rogers. Most of these guys, it's really taken into account their performances at Corrales, um, at the Texas Open, and then I believe Mirfield Village for some of these guys as well. Now, when you total that all up, the top 10 that I got for my model, Steven Yeager, Mark Hubbard, Patrick Rogers, Chez Reeby, Akshay Batia, I really like that one, Nick Hardy, Scott Piercy, Charlie Hoffman, Joseph Bramlett, and Austin Smotherman. So I was pretty satisfied with how that model turned out. I think it really does get, without getting too in the weeds, I think it gets a lot of the key factors that are going to play into this week. All right, so instead of talking about the golf course, let's see if we can find some individual golfers that can help us win some money this week. All right, let me scroll up to the top here. So let's look at the cheat sheet here on rickrungood.com. So the guy at the top of the board is going to be Keith Mitchell, which is a little bit surprising to me. I really think that they're basing this off of like perceived ceiling as opposed to actual recent form or actual um, results, which is kind of interesting. Um, so what we know about Keith Mitchell, Keith Mitchell generally performs well at courses that Rory McIlroy plays well at. So courses that value great driving of the golf ball in both distance and accuracy, um, and courses that he can hit a lot of greens at because he's not going to hit a lot of putts. Now, when you look at his results, he tends to do better at the courses where driving matters, like the fifth place finish at Riviera, like the fourth place finish at Pebble Beach, ninth at Memorial Park, 20th at the U.S. Open. So I do think this is going to be a decent setup for him. Uh, he did make the cut at Mirfield Village earlier in the year, but I don't necessarily know if he's my top pick this week. I don't know if he's worth paying all the way up for. I'll probably have a little bit of Keith Mitchell because I actually think he's going to go relatively under owned for a top, you know, top of the board player. But I just I don't really necessarily like this stat profile. Like he has shown the ability to gain strokes on approach. 
But when he does, he usually loses it all back with the putter. He's shown the ability to gain strokes with the putter. But when he does, he usually loses it all back around the green or on approach. The one consistency you can bank on with Keith Mitchell is that driver, which maybe this week at a course that is going to play pretty easy, maybe that's all he needs. I don't know. I think I'm willing to play a little bit of Keith Mitchell in DFS this week, but I'm not betting him to win the tournament, and I don't think that he's my favorite play of the week. Second up on the board is going to be Steven Yeager, who – is probably going to be the guy at the top that I play the most in my lineups. I'm also going to go with a little bit more of a balanced build, more on that later. But Steven Yeager is a guy that I really like at the top of my lineups. He's just been really good in the ball striking categories lately. And in his last two starts at Detroit Golf Club and TPC Deer Run, he's finally gained multiple strokes with the putter. When you combine ball striking with a good putter, that is the formula for winning an event like this that's going to value birdies and going to value scoring more than even a normal event. So I definitely like this setup for Steven Yeager. I like the fact that he's excelled at long courses. I like the fact that the ball striking numbers are good. And I like the fact that the putter is starting to heat up. I really like Steven Yeager this week. If I had to pick one guy to win this tournament, he would probably be the guy that I would pick. Odds notwithstanding, I think there is a better bet on the board. And I'm going to talk about that guy a little bit later. Now, after Steven Yeager is Taylor Pendrith, who much like... Jaeger is coming off of like his two best finishes of the entire season. T14 Detroit Golf Club, sixth place finish at the Barbasol Championship last week. And if you look at how he's done it, he has done it by just totally flipping his ball striking on its head. He's gained about eight strokes in the ball striking categories in each of the last two events, and he has not been negative with the putter in each of his last two events. Now, granted, at Detroit Golf Club, he was almost neutral with the putter. At Keen Trace, he was able to gain four strokes with the putter, but still lost a stroke around the green. So with Taylor Pendrith, I really like where the ball striking numbers are at. I like the fact that he's shown the ability to hit with the putter. And I also really like his course history as well. This is actually the second straight week in a row that Taylor Pendrith has come into the week with an 11th and a 13th um, in his history at that golf course. Last week, he finished sixth in his third appearance. So I definitely think he can repeat the result again this week. I really like him to give you another solid finish, but I really think Jaeger is more likely to win the tournament than Taylor Pender. Now, next on the board is the guy who actually won last week, and that is Vincent Norman. And when you look at how he did it, I generally like Norman long-term. I think he's talented, even though he is an Oklahoma Sooner. Um, I do like his talent because he pretty much, much like Keith Mitchell, always gains strokes off the tee. He's really long off the tee, and he hits it straight as well. So he's going to always look good in the ball striking categories. But if you look at how he won last week, he gained almost four strokes around the green. He gained five strokes with the putter, and that is not typical for his profile. So, Norman, congratulations on your win. I wish you the best of luck, even though you are an Oklahoma Sooner but I'm probably going to find you sometime back down the road because I just don't like the chances of you going back to back uh, eight strokes, nine strokes even in the short game categories. I just don't think that's likely to happen back to back. All right, now let's go ahead and look a little further down the board. That does it for the 10K range. I actually think it's going to be very common this week and very possible to start your lineups in the 9K range. And there are two guys that I want to talk about uh, for sure that I think are probably going to be the ones that end up being very popular. First off is going to be Mark Hubbard. He has a fourth and a 43rd at this event. And if you look at how he's been playing lately, his approach numbers have been really, really good. And his putting numbers have been really, really good. But he has not really gained strokes off the tee a whole lot. Well, where's the last place he gained strokes off the tee? Mirfield Village. Jack Nicklaus design, wide fairways, not very demanding with the driver. So that's a place where he gained strokes off the tee because he was able to keep it in the fairway more often than not. And then he paired that with good approach play. That week he lost strokes with the putter, which is not typical for him. And he had a 30th place finish in a tough field. So I think this is a great setup for Mark Hubbard. I like the fact that he has history at this course in this event. I do think that that's going to play with a little bit of advantage with the elevation changes and the format changes. Um, so I really, really like Mark Hubbard this week. I think he's going to be the guy who is very popular because I think when you look at the kind of the whole board, if you're starting with a more balanced build, I think Mark Hubbard is where people are going to start. And I think he's actually cheap enough that if you wanted to get really funky, I think you could start off a lineup with Jaeger Hubbard or Mitchell Hubbard or Pendrith Hubbard uh, and then find ways to kind of relieve that salary further down the board. But I really like Mark Hubbard this week. Next up that we got to talk about is Patrick Rogers. 
and he's coming off of three straight missed cuts. But when you look at the strokes gain numbers, they had to have all been like either right on the number or one off the number because the strokes gain numbers are not that bad, especially the strokes gain total numbers. Like they're very close to neutral. Uh, but what we know about Patrick Rogers, two best parts of his skill set, the driver and the putter. And you know, what's kind of going to be required if you want to win a birdie fest, going to have to drive it well, going to have to putt it well. Another course that kind of has wide fairways and was a birdie fest was the Mexico open at Vedanta. Uh, finished T10, drove it well, putted it well. And so I think that that might be the formula for Patrick Rogers this week. He's a guy that you can play based more so off of course fit than based off of recent form. Now, a guy that has a combination of both course fit and recent form is Bo Hostler. So when you look at Bo Hostler, he generally is pretty good with the driver. However, where he can get himself in trouble is like the more tree-lined Park One golf courses or even the golf courses where there's like super thick rough where you can't hack it out of it. If there's not a whole lot of hazards off the tee, Bo Hostler generally does pretty well off the tee. And what I also like lately is that in two straight appearances, he's gained multiple strokes on approach. So I definitely think that the approach is trending in the right direction. The driver's still going to be solid. Um, I definitely think that's a good formula for Bo Hostler. And he's also a big time birdie or better guy. Bo has a very high birdie percentage. He also has a very high bogey percentage. Like we talked about at this tournament, birdie bogey is going to be better than par par. So I definitely think the format plays into his hands as a guy who can, you know, really score a lot of birdies. Next up on the board is going to be Nick Hardy, who on paper, in my opinion, sets up so well for this event. So Nick Hardy is a young guy, but what we know about him and where he was most successful last summer was he was really good with the driver off the tee. He had a tendency to get hot with the irons and he had a tendency to get hot with the putter. Well, that's not exactly what's been happening lately. Nick Hardy's best performances lately have been pretty much neutral with the driver, not great on approach, and then relying on getting hot with the putter. I don't think that's a formula for success that we really want. However, with how he has profiled over the years, I do think this course should fit his skill set well, but he's not really showing his peak skill set here in the last month. So Hardy's probably a guy that I'm not going to be playing a lot of this week. Now, when you go to birdie fests, it's always an advantage to be a great putter, right? Well, I think undisputably the best putter in this field is Justin Suh. And, and I don't really think it's up for debate. He has gained strokes with the putter in every single event dating back to the RBC Heritage back in April. That was so long ago. In fact, he's gained over 1.5 strokes putting in every event in that span. The putter is going to serve Justin so well. What is to be determined is whether or not the rest of his back is going to serve him well. When he does manage to have a good week off the tee or on approach, he plays pretty well. If you remember the Memorial Tournament at Mirfield Village, he finished with a T41, but he was actually in the final pairing on Saturday. I believe it was with Hideki Matsuyama, and I think he kind of like let the moment get a little too big for him, just got off to a terrible start, had a few unlucky bounces, and just kind of faded down the stretch on Saturday and Sunday. But I definitely think that that performance is something that he can build on at a course that's layout is pretty similar to this one. Like I said, at a birdie fest, never count against the best putter in the field, and so I definitely think this is is a better than average setup for Justin So, All right, that does it for the 9K range. I think if I were to go with a balanced build, it's probably going to start with Mark Hubbard up top. And I think it's also probably going to avoid the 6K range or like dip like one guy into the 6K range because there are two guys in this 8K range that I really, really like this week. Longtime listeners of the podcast, y'all probably know exactly where this next one's going. It's Akshay Batia. So Akshay Batia is a guy that I play a lot in DraftKings. And I have a lot of interest in the outright betting market in. I, now I'm in North Carolina, so I can't actually put money on him. But I just think that he's eventually going to win a PGA Tour golf tournament. I think he's really talented. He's a lefty who hits the driver really far and straight. He is really precise with his irons. He can get really hot with the irons. Dude just can't putt to save his life. We all have a friend who plays like Akshay Patia, just a much less version, right? We all know that guy that that just, you know, can ball strike it all over the place and then just can't hit a putt to save our lives, right? So for Akshay this week, I really like what he did last week at the Barbasol. Gained two and a half strokes off the tee, gained five strokes on approach, a little better than neutral around the green, and then dead neutral with the putter. Did not gain a stroke, did not lose a stroke. 
dead neutral. And when he was dead neutral with the putter, he finished T9. Earlier in the year at the Mexico Open, he gained five strokes with the putter, and guess what? Came in fourth. He was not as good off the tee in that event. So pretty much, if Akshay just plays how he's been playing with the ball striking and just putts to a neutral to slightly above average, he's going to have a great week. He really excels at long golf courses. He really excels at long par fours. And he really gives himself so many birdie looks that if he can just roll a few in, this could finally be the week that Akshay Batia breaks down the door. Now, the other guy in the 8K range that I got to talk about is Joseph Bramlett. So Bramlett popped up for him a lot of the stuff on my custom model that we used. But if you look at his recent form, it really hasn't been there. But he is playing what I would be calling whack-a-mole golf right now. Like he is just, he has one problem and he fixes it, plugs it up, and then another one pops up, right? So when you look at his last great finish was Mirfield Village T16. Hey, we've said that one a few times already. Also T19 at uh, TBC Craig Ranch, another one of my comp courses. But he's been playing whack-a-mole, right? So at TBC River Highlands was terrible off the tee. Okay, next start at Detroit was good off the tee, lost five and a half strokes with the putter through two rounds. Okay, next start at TBC Deer Run, almost neutral with the putter, loses two strokes on approach. Next start at the Renaissance Club, gains three strokes on approach, loses three strokes around the green. So he's just kind of just plugging all of it, right? But at this point, he's kind of had an opportunity to plug every part of his game except around the green. So I kind of think that if the pattern continues, then he's going to plug around the green this week and he's just going to be bad with the putter again, which I'm kind of willing to be okay with because I kind of think that the putter is the most fluky one of all and he's shown us the potential to have good putting weeks. So I kind of think this is another week that we can get back on Joseph Bramlett. I really like Joseph Bramlett this week. Now, the last guy in the AK range that I do want to talk about is Peter Quest. So, Peter Quest, I got to find his profile. Give me one second. So, Peter Quest is a guy that um, was really hot after his uh, great Sunday, great weekend, actually, at the Rocket Mortgage Classic. But he kind of faltered a little bit last week. He missed the cut at the Barbasol Championship, which was actually the weakest field event that he had played in. But if you look at his strokes gain profile, I'm actually totally willing to write that one off as more of a one-off and go back to him. And so I kind of really like where Peter Quest is heading to this event. I think the missed cut last week is going to keep a lot of people off of him in terms of ownership. Last week, he gained three and a half strokes in the ball striking categories and lost three and a half strokes in the short game. And so that is not what he has shown the ability to do so far in his young career. He's been generally pretty good with the short game. So I think he's going to be able to plug that hole up. And I think this week, if I'm going with that balance build lineup, I really like the start of Hubbard and then Batia, and then either go with after Batia, Bramlett, or Peter Quest, depending on how much salary I want to spend. Now, last guy in the AK range that I do want to mention is Sam Stevens at $8,100. Generally, really good at long golf courses. However, his form that he had over uh, the course of like April, May, June has kind of cooled off. He's not playing as great a golf um, as he has been recently. So I'm, I'm kind of um, willing to give him a shot, but not really going all in on him. Now, looking down to the 7K range, there are a few plays that are interesting. Nathan Kimsey was the runner-up last week at the Barbasol Championship, was also 10th in his last event in Europe. He is not a long hitter off the tee, which kind of plays into kind of the Ches Reby role because Ches Reby is not long off the tee, and Ches Reby won this tournament last year. But I, I don't know. I'm kind of just not completely sold because he's doing a lot of his work with the putter. Nicholas Muller is a guy that popped up from a lot of stuff on the mo uh, the model. I'm probably going to be playing a little bit of him just based off of that. But a few guys that I do want to give more of a detailed breakdown in the 7K range. First up is Grayson Sig. So Grayson Sig has just been an elite approach player for the last two months. He's gained over two, gained over two strokes on approach in each of his last four starts, which has led to generally good ball striking weeks. The putter has been hot and cold. But hey, if you get a hot week with the putter, he's shown the ability that it can be a very good week. And I just really like those approach numbers on a course that he's not really going to be tested off the tee and can really put those irons to good use and give himself a lot of birdie looks. I think this course sets up pretty well for Grayson Sig. Now, the other guy I want to talk about is Carson Young. So Carson Young had an ugly, ugly missed cut at TPC Deer Run. But 
what we do like about Carson Young, much like we talked about with Justin Suh. He is a great putter. He has not lost strokes putting since the, the Valero Texas Open back at the start of April. And he's kind of a guy who can be hot or cold on approach. Carson Young's the type of guy that you don't want to play in a cash game lineup in DFS. You want to play him in a tournament because he's either going to be really good and give you like a top 20 finish, or he's going to miss the cut badly. But I'm willing to take the chance that this is going to be a good week because he has been good with the putter and he's generally been pretty good on approach. And so I am willing to go back to Carson Young for that reason. Next guy in the 7K range that I got to talk about is Trevor Cohn. So Trevor Cohn was um, a guy that I played a few times in showdown last week, and he really paid it off. Um, but the I didn't have enough of him in the whole tournament that, that I probably should have. Because heading into last week, he had two straight weeks where he gained over four strokes in the ball striking categories, and his short game let him down. Well, guess what? Last week, his short game let him down again, but he gained 14 strokes in the ball striking categories in route to a T3 finish at the Barbasol. So I really like the fact that he had that great of a week ball striking. Is he going to gain 14 strokes to the field again? Probably not, but can he still give you a good ball striking week and just be neutral and just tread water with chipping and putting? Yes, absolutely he can do that. So I really think Trevor Cohn is a really solid play in the 7K range this week. Another guy that I got to talk about is Marty Doe. So Marty Doe, he's kind of like Akshay Jr., where I play Marty Doe a lot, uh, especially in Showdown DFS, because he's the guy who can really get hot over the course of one round. His his course management is super aggressive. He just really goes pin hunting, and he can kind of get himself in some bad spots. But at a course like TPC Craig Ranch, which has been one of my comp courses, he didn't get punished for it a whole lot because he was really on, and it really wasn't that difficult of a course either. Came in T5th, which was his best finish of the season. He has shown good approach numbers in the last month. He's just been hot or cold with the putter and hot or cold with the driver. Well, guess what? Like we've talked about this week, I don't think the driver, there's going to be a lot of consequences for not being great with the driver. So I think this sets up really well for Marty Doe, and I'm absolutely willing to go back to him. Tano Goya is the last guy in the 7K range that I want to talk about. He was just really solid last week with everything except the putter. Um, and he's been really solid with pretty much all aspects of his game for the last month. Uh, Detroit Golf Club, just really bad on approach, really bad with the putter, kind of uncharacteristically. But I kind of like where the form is at. I like the price tag on Tano Goya. I think he is kind of a low risk, probably going to make the cut guy. Probably doesn't have the upside to win the golf tournament. Is there anybody else in the 7K range that I wanted to mention? Oh, it is a birdie fest. If you want to go with one of the best putters in the field, Justin Lauer is that guy. Coming off of two straight made cuts and a 16th place finish here last year. Marcus Helikilde disappointed us a little bit with a missed cut at the Barbasol last week, but he did have a 13th place finish in this event last year. I don't think he's a terrible play. And then Eric Van Ruyen does hold the tournament record for um, stable for scoring points. He's a guy who can get really hot. He's also a guy who can get really cold. Um, play him at your own risk for that reason. And then Sean Crocker has an interesting combination of recent form as well as um, – course history with a 19th place finish last week and a 13th place finish last year. And then Troy Merritt is the last guy that I will mention in the 7K range. So Troy Merritt is a guy that plays very well at easy courses, plays very well in weak fields. At the John Deere, the Rocket Mortgage, easy course, weak field, boom, 17th place finish. This tournament, easy course, weak field, he has two second place finishes here. I'm willing to go with Troy Merritt for that reason. Jimmy Walker is like the great value Keith Mitchell. He's really good with the driver off the tee. He doesn't really do a whole lot else well. However, he can get hot with the putter. I think he's worth a look at a price tag of even $7,000. All right, so now let's get into the 6K range. So the first guy that pops off the page to me is Kevin Tway, who has four straight made cuts at this event in the three editions that have been at um, – Tahoe Mountain Club. He's came in 22nd, 30th, and 35th. And I think when you look at his profile, it's not really great. But what you see is these random spike weeks, right? Like the randomly gained four strokes around the green last week. Randomly gained five strokes on approach at TPC Craig Ranch. Hey, it, for a guy in the 6K range, if you get a random spike week out of, out of Kevin Tway this week, it's really going to pay itself off for you. Now, another guy that I do want to mention that has elite level course history here is Martin Laird. 
Uh, his recent form is absolutely terrible, but he has a third place finish at this course, seventh and 15th at another course. I don't mind it. I, I don't think he's the best play in this range, but I think he's far from the worst. I think when you got actionable course history this week, that is something that's worth mentioning. Now, Kramer Hickok is another guy that I want to talk about. He had just been kind of not great since the you know it, the the Texas swing in May where he did twenty uh, first at uh, Colonial Country Club, and last week he got back to a T twenty eight at the Barbasol. Well, he flipped his ball striking numbers around, flipped the putter around. Is it something that he can sustain into this week? I think there's a possibility that he can. I think what he did last week was very sustainable, um, and so I do think he's not a bad play in the 6K range. One of my favorite plays in the 6K range is going to be Louis de Jager. Um, I just think when you look at what he did last week, uh, gaining 10 strokes in the ball striking categories, that's pretty elite. You know, he only came in a tie for 16th place, but that's because he lost almost three strokes with the putter. I really like the ball striking numbers for Louis D. All right, so there are three more guys that I do want to talk about before we wrap it up that are in the 6K range. The first of which is Adrian Sadier. And I'm pretty confident I'm saying that correctly. Sadier. It is French. It's so I'm, I'm confident it's not just Sadier. It's got to be Sadier. Right, gotta have that little French flair to it. Anyway, that's beside the point. So, Sadie has got a really good stat profile because a lot of people would look at it and say, "Oh, he just gained seven strokes putting last week. That was fluky. I'm writing that off." Well, he also gained over five strokes putting and over seven strokes putting in two other events this year. So he has shown the ability to get hot with the putter. What I really care about is the ball striking numbers. They've been consistently good. He has not lost strokes in the ball striking category since the start of June. And he has not finished worse than 35th on the DP World Tour or in the Barbasol Championship last week in the, since the start of June. So I actually really think that Adrian Sadier is in a really good spot. I think he's got a really good price tag. I'm really willing to go back to Adrian Sadier this week. Now, the next guy I want to talk about is Cody Gribble, who is left-handed. There's not many lefties left on the PGA Tour. I know you got Gribble, you got Akshay, you got Brian Harmon, Robert McIntyre. There's not a lot of them, y'all. And I probably care about that more than most because I am left-handed, and I do feel the pain of these guys because it's terribly difficult to find left-handed golf clubs. Anyway, that's beside the point. So Cody Gribble last week. A lot of people look at it and just see, oh, 252, that's a pretty mediocre finish, right? Well, he gained seven strokes in the ball striking categories, which is really good but he lost nine strokes with the putter. Nine. That's really bad. Like, like, did he decide to try to putt right-handed last week, or was he putting with a wedge last week? Like, something had to have gone wrong for him to lose nine strokes with the putter, right? That's not something he normally does. In three of his last five events, he's gained strokes with the putter. In fact, he gained 4.72 with the putter at the Charles Schwab Challenge. So if Cody Gerbel can just continue that ball striking and just not be like the worst putter in the field, I think he can have a really good week this week here at the Barracuda Championship. And the last guy that I want to talk about is Richie Wierenski. Look, he, his recent form's not great. His strokes gain numbers aren't great, but he's a former winner of this event, and he's got two things that he does well. He hits driver pretty well. He putts pretty well, and that's what he's done last week in the two weeks that he made the cut. The other numbers haven't been great, but I think if you're looking for guys this far down the board, you got a guy who's got two actionable skills. He's won this event before. I think there's a lot worse plays you could have than Richie Wierenski. All right, so that does it for the 6K range, and that does it for – the Barracuda Championship Preview. If you like what you saw in this video, please hit that subscribe button. It really helps me out a lot. You'll be notified when all of our new episodes drop, like next week, the 3M Open Preview. The week after that, we're going to be doing a preview for Liv Greenbrier. And then also next week, we're going to have our Pup Cup Strategy and Picks show coming out, um, which is the best ball draft that is on Underdog. If you're interested in doing drafts or playing uh, player props on Underdog, use my promo code mconley 88 um, You'll be, have your first deposit matched up to $100. If you subscribe, you'll be notified when all those episodes drop, and I really do appreciate it. I really do thank you if you subscribe. If you like what you saw in this video, you got a lot of actionable information, hit that like button. It really helps me out a lot. I really appreciate it. Hopefully, I was able to give you guys a lot of information that can help you fill out your DFS lineups and help you fill out your betting cards this week. Um, I really do appreciate you guys watching or listening this long. Thank you guys for sticking around. I will see you next time.